Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another Understanding Deep Learning seminar. Today, Samuel will talk to us about signal propagation and dynamic isometry in deep neural networks. Sam is a senior research scientist at Google Brain, working at the intersection between learning and physics. His work focuses on better understanding the large width limits of neural networks using techniques from statistical physics as well as applying advanced machine learning to physical systems. Sam received his PhD in physics from the University of Pennsylvania in 2015. Sam, please take it away. Thanks, Joe. Um, yeah, so I, 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 I'm excited to talk um, to talk here today. Um, okay, so I think this should be showing. If it's not, let me know. Um, so yeah, I'm, so I'm excited to talk about uh, some work that we've been doing over the past several years, uh, trying to better understand the, pri the priors over function space that deep neural networks place um, when we initialize them randomly. And in particular, I'm going to focus on two things. As, as Ja mentioned, I'm going to talk about um, signal propagation in these networks and dynamical isometry. And I hope to explain what each of these uh, terms mean in a little bit. But first, I'd like to say that you know this is was really a collaborative effort um, with a ton of people, uh, and I, I did you know some fraction of the work. But uh, you know, Joshua, Jeffrey, Surya. Greg, Lichow, Minmin, Jehun, Yasmin, Dar, and Bo did a ton of the heavy lifting. So to start with, I'd like to um, give a little bit of motivation for why we should care about understanding the prior over functions that neural networks place. Um, and one of the things that we've seen in the past you know, few decades, but especially recently, is a proliferation of models in deep learning. So you know, as we've expanded neural networks to, multi to different tasks, and as uh, more people have done research on them and our, our um, understanding has advanced, we've really expanded the set of architectures that we look at. So for example, we went from fully connected networks to convolutional networks, and then you know maybe things got a little bit more complicated, and now they've simplified a bit. bit. We had inception, now we have residual networks. Um, in language modeling, we saw similar growth um, where we went from you know simple recurrent cells to LSTMs, and now uh, you know since 2017, people have been more focused on transformer architectures. So, you know, when 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 a practitioner is is trying to design a new network architecture or proposes a new network architecture or, or a modification to some architecture, what happens? So. You know, usually what happens is I might have an idea for something that I'd like to try. Maybe I want to add a new residual connection somewhere, or I want to add a new kind of normalization, or I would like to try a new functional form for some component. So I'll, I'll have some modification that I propose, um, and then there will be some set of hyperparameters that sort of controls this new modification and, and the, the original architecture as well. So, so there's some set of, set, set of hyperparameters and what I might do is I, I might randomly select a hyperparameter, and then I'll initialize the network randomly, train the network, and evaluate the performance. Um, and then I'll, I'll kind of repeat this, this inner loop process uh, until I've saturated some computational budget, maybe, or, or until I, I've, I've decided that I understand the situation well enough. Um, and then I'll repeat from one, so maybe maybe this architectural improvement helped, maybe it didn't, but then I'll keep proposing new things until I'm either happy with my performance on the task or I run into a conference deadline or whatever. Um, and I, I think, you know, <clears throat> this is somewhat problematic. Uh, and the reason why it's problematic is because it conflates two things. It conflates how well our model performs on the one hand, or the architecture performs, with how easily it was to train. And while these often go together, they don't always go together. Um, and so I think what, you know, one of the things that, that's been plaguing deep learning recently is that um, you know, you'll, you'll get an architecture like the transformer. And then over the next six months or so, you'll see a whole slew of architectural tweaks to transformers. So like, you know, 
um, changing how the positional encoding works or whatever, like small, small changes to the architecture. And then sort of sometime after that, a meta paper will come out that evaluates all of these different uh, proposals and finds that actually very few of them were meaningful. Um, and in part because often the baselines weren't tuned properly or the tweaks themselves weren't tuned properly. So like there's this problem where you like, you have to understand how easy it is to train an architecture before you can understand the performance. Um, and so the question that I'd like to ask is, can we do something more principled? And, and I'd like to focus on this sort of inner loop where we randomly initialize the network and train and evaluate performance. And to kind of come up with something more principled, I'm gonna leverage some stuff that I think Joshua spoke about in this lecture series two weeks ago, which is the kind of neural tangent kernel and the neural network Gaussian process. So that's the lens that I'm gonna try to view this inner loop from. Um, so, so what we're going to do is instead of taking, you know, a single random network and training it, we're going to consider a thought experiment where we take a single, where we take an ensemble of random networks and train them all. And so this takes, you know, a prior over functions. I have some prior over functions that's specified by the distribution over weights that I'm sampling. So I have some weight distribution for all the parameters of my network. And I'm I'm randomly sampling those those weight those weights, and then I'm using gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent or something to produce a, a new set of parameters after training. Um, and this is what we do all the time. And this takes you know a prior over functions to something that's like a posterior. It's not a posterior in the Bayes rule sense, but it it has the flavor of a posterior. Um, and so you know what I'd like to say is that good hyperparameters correspond to selecting a good prior. And while generally these priors are intractable, one of the innovations in deep learning over the past couple of years, and this is I think what Josh has spoke about, but I'll, I'll go through you know, a little bit of background in case people missed his talk and that's fine. Uh, you, you, you don't need to have seen it. Is that as these neural networks actually get very wide, um, the prior converges to a family of models known as Gaussian processes, which are much simpler, and they actually have tractable densities. So that you can do a lot with them. You can actually understand a lot about the prior, it turns out, for, for infinitely wide um, neural networks. Moreover, and, and more recently it's been shown that, I, that sometimes if you, if you set up your neural network right, not only does the prior converge to a Gaussian process, but the posterior under gradient descent also converges to a Gaussian process via the neural tangent kernel. Um, and I'm not gonna talk about that so much, um, but I, and I'll get to it in a moment, that there, there is a bit more. So, so in this talk, um, I wanna focus on what are the properties of the prior and how does this, and empirically investigate, how does this prior co translate to whether or not I can train a neural network? And, and my, my claim is, we can make sort of very general statements about, about the prior over functions uh, based on signal propagation and dynamical isometry. And then we can predict whether or not the neural network will be trainable. And um, in a couple of weeks time, and I think in two weeks time, Le Chao is gonna be talking about kind of the same topic, but he's gonna be speaking about it using the neural tangent kernel to make a stronger connection that's more theoretical between the properties that I'm gonna talk about today and training and generalization. And we'll see that like kind of a very nice picture emerges. But for today, I'm just gonna be talking about in motivating the prior as a, as a thing that we should study um, and empirically showing that for many different kinds of neural networks, uh, the properties of the prior correlate strongly with whether or not the network can be trained. Um, so I guess I, I don't have the question, if there are any questions, uh, I'm happy to t uh, answer anything now um, before going into sort of the meat of the talk. Otherwise, I can just start. Okay, so, um, so one thing that I wanna talk about, just mention briefly uh, before, before getting into the weeds, um, is that there's sort of like an interesting and maybe unfortunate word choice. Um, in papers that we, we were writing, a lot of these papers that I'm gonna talk about today, before the theory showing convergence to Gaussian processes formally um, came out. And 
So we often refer to like neural, the neural network Gaussian process and the NTK as mean field quantities. There are also other uses of the word mean field theory, uh, for example, by Montanari. Um, and, and while they're maybe related and they both deal with infinite width networks, they're, they're not exactly the same. And, and in, even in physics, um, the term mean field can end up meaning a lot of different things depending on what the set of approximations is. So, so, so this is just one thing that I, I know has confused people in the past uh, when looking at the literature. So I just wanted to highlight it. If you do decide this is interesting and you want to read more, note that when we when I say mean field, I don't mean mean field in, in another sense. I just mean the neural network Gaussian process or the NTK. And I can, it, you know, if there are questions about this, I'm happy to elaborate on why the NNGP and NTK are mean field. Okay, so so now uh, I want to kind of go through how like what the prior over functions actually looks like for an infinitely wide network, and and for that I'm going to appeal to this old paper from the '90s by Radford Neal, which was just an absolutely beautiful paper. Um, and if you're interested in this topic, I highly recommend you read it. It's very approachable. Uh, and so what I want to do is I want to consider two inputs, um, and I'm going to call them x sub a. Um, and one thing that we can define about these inputs is we can define the uncentered uh, second moment matrix. So the, this is kind of like the covariance matrix, but we don't subtract the mean. And I'm going to call this sigma naught. Um, and this is just an empirical quantity uh, based on the inputs where we sum we're summing here over the features. So I, I is an index over the features. So we, we are computing the, the uncentered second moment matrix. And then we're going to feed these two inputs into a neural network. And the neural network is going to be parameterized by weights, W, and biases, B. And the weights are going to be drawn from a Gaussian uh, with uh, variance, with mean zero and variance sigma W squared uh, over the, the Fanon width. And so this is just a normalization to keep everything uh, from blowing up. And the biases are going to be drawn from a normal distribution with variance sigma b. And so in this context, sigma w, the width of the layers, and sigma b are sort of going to be the hyperparameters that we might be optimizing over if we were trying to make this network work in practice. So, so these would be our hyperparameters. And then our network is going to be one hidden layer. So first, um, we. First, we have the Z is going to be the pre-activations in a layer, and it's just going to be the, the first layer weights multiplied by the inputs plus the bias. And then the second layer activations are going to be, or, or the readout is going to be the second layer weights times an activation function phi acting on the first layer pre-activations plus the bias. Um, and if we look at this for a little while, one thing that we notice is that at initialization, the x's are all deterministic. So the x's are given. Um, and then the w's are drawn from a Gaussian distribution, and the b's are also drawn from a Gaussian distribution. So actually, the z's at initialization will themselves be Gaussian. And this is exactly true. And if you do a little bit of math, you can work out that the covariance matrix for the b's, for the, for the, for the z's in the first layer, has a term sigma AB, which depends on the example index, but it doesn't depend on the which, which feature it is. So the features end up being IID, identically and um, independently distributed. And what you might remember from you know, central limit theorem statistics is that when you have a sum, so these z's now are iid when considered over the feature dimension, um, which is the, the j or the i index. And when you have a sum, so the second layer looks like a sum of these independent and identically distributed random variables. Um, and so while for finite width, these will generically be non-Gaussian. As the width goes to infinity, we can invoke the central limit theorem. And we can say that actually not only were the first layer Gaussian, but actually the second layer also was Gaussian. And 
it is another it, it's another Gaussian distribution that's described by some other covariance matrix, sigma two. And so the upshot here is that infinitely wide shallow networks are Gaussian processes, and you can work out what the covariance matrix is. So what you can do then is you can just kind of like write down, um, at integrating over the Ws, what the covariance matrix looks like. Um, and what I think is so nice about this approach is that it takes you from this very complicated situation where you were focusing on, you know, maybe an input that has an image dimension, a pixel dimension, and then a, and then, and there, there are multiple examples and you have like a ton of weights. So you have like a lot of parameters. And in the infinite width limit, we see that actually we don't have to consider the parameters and we don't really have to consider the features either. The only thing we have to track is this example by example covariance matrix. And so it's like, a very large dimensionality reduction um, that's happening. And anytime I think, you know, you have this like very large reduction in dimensionality, you can gain insight into the problem. Um, and, and so then, you know, the more modern uh, take on this is to extend, you know, this, this notion to deep networks. So um, you can you can kind of just iterate this approach where now instead of having a single layer where we have z1 going into some output y we're going to have z1 going into z2 and then so on some number of layers and then it, eventually we have some elf layer zl and that's a function of zl minus one and we can kind of schematically take this infinite with limit layer by layer and, and you know i think one of the things that i'd like to say is i'm, I'm going to be talking about this sort of from the least rigorous possible perspective. Um, there's been a lot of papers that sort of try to make these statements rigorous, um, but I'm just talking about it very schematically. Uh, so you can take the infinite with limit layer by layer and you 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 get instead <clears throat> of having to deal with this um, recurrence relation over these high dimensional vectors, we now get a recurrence relation over covariance matrices and again, you know, this is a, a significant simpl simplification. Um, and so what we can say is that neural networks induce sort of a dynamical system over the space of covariance matrices. And so if we want to understand properties of the prior over functions placed by neural networks, it suffices to sort of study this dynamical system um, that these neural networks induce. Okay, and, and so I think before I go on, if there are any questions on this so far, I'm happy to answer them. Maybe I should just quickly make sure that there aren't any, that I'm not missing anything in the chat. Okay, great. So, um, okay, so given, given now that we have, um, we've kind of set up the problem where we, we now have this like, this dynamical system over covariance matrices that we want to study instead of studying the pre-activations directly, um, we're actually going to make some more simplifying assumptions. Because what we'd really like to do is we'd really like to study this dynamical system and understand what it means um, or what its properties are and how those properties correlate with neural network performance. So what we're going to do is instead of considering like a whole data set or something as you would in the more NNGP focused work. Here we're just going to consider two inputs. So we're going to consider a pair of inputs and we're going to have them we're going to study how they behave as they move through the network. So as they as we act on them layer by layer, we're going to like look at how these two inputs evolve. Um and so what we're going to do is we're first going to, we're free, you know, as, as researchers to choose any normalization we want for the inputs, because we're, you know, this is our, this is our thought experiment and we can do whatever we want. Um, and what we're going to find is that the normalization doesn't matter too much, but for simplicity, what we're going to do is we're just going to normalize the inputs so that they all live on a sphere, a hypersphere with some radius. And the radius we're going to choose is the number of hidden units or um, times some Q naught. And so Q naught is a parameter that we get to vary and it's just Q is always gonna be the magnitude of, the, of, of, of an example. 
And one of the things that's nice about this is if I normalize two inputs to have the same norm, by symmetry, those two inputs will continue to have the same norm at every layer of the network within mean field theory. This is not true when you go beyond the infinite with limit, but at least um, at least in the level of, 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 of um, Gaussian processes, it is true. So, so these, these two inputs will continue by symmetry to have the same norm at each layer of the network. Um, and so what we can do is we can write down the covariance matrix um, has a very specific form. The covariance matrix at layer L, so this is the covariance matrix describing the Gaussian process um, for, for these two inputs. And it has a term that looks like the variance and then it has an, a term like the diagonals are ones, and then the off diagonals are these things that I'm going to call C sub super L. So C L is the is is the value of the off diagonal elements when scaled by by the the variance um, for the covariance matrix. And what these C's are, if you think about them a little bit, is these C's are basically like the expected angle or the expected cosine angle between the two inputs at each layer. So as you move, as these two inputs move through the network, the average angle between them will evolve. And so we're just tracking that. We're tracking, so we're tracking two things. We're tracking the norms of these two inputs and we're tracking the angle between them. And, and so we've really simplified this like very complicated high dimensional problem to a very low dimensional problem where we really only need to track two numbers. Um, and so for many neural network architectures, and so here we're just talking about fully connected networks. Um, but in particular, for neural network architectures whose nonlinearities are um, bounded, like Tanch, the generically it seems like the dynamical system will have a fixed point. So if I if I kept iterating my neural network and I made it deeper and deeper and deeper, eventually, um, no matter what inputs I started with the covariance matrix would appoint, or approach some fixed point sigma star. And we can write down that sigma star can, you know, has, has the same form. All sigmas have the same form. And, and so it's defined by a Q star and a C star, where Q star is like the asymptotic variance and C star is the asymptotic angle or asymptotic cosine angle between the two inputs. Um, and so we can, we can do this in practice. So here are the plots of this variance term and the cosine angle term minus the, the asymptotic value for neural networks. And these different curves are changing the variance of the weights. So remember we had two or three hyperparameters or really two hyperparameters. We had the variance of the weights and the variance of the biases. So here we're changing the variance of the weights and we're seeing that the um, kind of, in all cases you get sort of this exponential convergence. Um, and one thing that we observe is that the um, convergence of the variance is fast. So if we look on the left-hand plot, which is the convergence of the variance, we see that it happens over um, like 30 layers. <laughs> oh, sorry. <laughs> anyway, uh, it happens over about 30 layers. Whereas um, the convergence of the cosine similarity happens over a much longer time. So here we're seeing the cosine similarity converge over around 300 layers. And, and for some values of the weight variance, uh, it still hasn't converged. So we're going to make one more simplifying assumption, which is that we can ignore the Q factor by just initializing. We know we can, for any given network, we can compute where the fixed point is. And we can initialize our inputs to have that variance. So we're going to initialize our, our, our inputs so that Q naught equals Q star. And then we've really reduced our problem to a one-dimensional problem. We're just looking at how the angle between two inputs evolves as we go through the network. Um, and so, you know, one one thought experiment I'd like to ask is what happens if the cosine angle is so close to the asymptotic value for the cosine angle that it's at the limits of floating point and accurate floating point accuracy. For, for whatever machine, so float 64 or float 32, depending on how you're running your experiments. So in this case, 
For all inputs to the network, the statistics of the output are unchanged. So I could imagine taking two inputs, and I could imagine rotating one of the inputs around the other in a circle. And you would normally want the output of the network to change for this translation or, or distortion of the input. And what you would find is that the output really, the statistics of the output didn't change in the, in the infinite width limit. And so uh, a corollary of this is that learning is impossible. The output of the network doesn't depend on the input of the network. So how can you possibly use it to learn? There's no signal getting through. So this is what I mean when I say signal propagation. It's, it's um, if, I, if I wiggle the input, can that signal of the wiggling of the input get to the output? And so what this means is that we can figure out what the maximum trainable depth of a network is. And so if I give you a neural network, or if you give me a neural network, I can tell you how deep, or a, 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 let's say we're talking about like residual networks where you have like a, a module that you stack on top of each other. If, I, if you give me a module, I can tell you how many times you can stack it by sort of telling you how fast the module makes this angle approach its fixed point value. Um, and to do this, we're gonna kind of play a trick that is extremely common in like dynamical systems theory um, and but if you haven't seen it before, that's fine. So what we're going to do is we're going to write down our ang our cosine angle as the fixed point cosine angle, so the asymptotic cosine angle, plus epsilon, where epsilon is taken to be small, and we can linearize the dynamics near this fixed point. Um, and so we can write for any given layer instead of writing um, this expression, this kind of complicated expression for the covariance matrix, we can linearize the, the, the recurrence relation and get a very simple relationship that, um, that epsilon at L plus one is given by epsilon at L scaled by some factor C, where C is something that's computed at the fixed point. So it's a property of the fixed point. And it's related to the derivative of the activation function at the fixed point. And so this gives you exponential dynamics. And so what this implies, if you think about it a bit, is that the epsilon at layer L will be given by this like C, C star to the power of L. And so if C of C star is greater than one, that means that if I start close to the fixed point, I'll go away from it exponentially quickly. So epsilon will grow exponentially fast as I move through the network. But if C, C star is less than one, then I conversely approach the fixed point exponentially. And that's what we're seeing in, these, in, these, in this figure on the right, is we're seeing this like exponential convergence and the slope of this convergence, so the slope of these exponentials is given by this C of C star. Um, and, and you can write this as a, as a number of layers, uh, C, um, if you want to. So this tells you sort of how many, for a given set of hyperparameters, if I compute C of C star and it's less than one, I can then say how many layers you could possibly train this network. Um, and one of the interesting things is that for fully connected networks, there's always a fixed point at one. So, and this makes sense. If I, if I pass in two identical inputs, they'll stay identical as they go through the network. Um, and so this, this fixed point is stable if C1 is less than, uh, if chi1 is less than one. Um, and then it's unstable if chi1 is greater than one. And so the stability of this fixed point defines this thing called an order to chaos, the, an order to chaos transition. And it's a phase transition. And what it means is that if I, if I think about my neural network in sort of a plane of sigma w and sigma b for each value of sigma w and sigma b i can decide i can calculate whether or not chi one or, or uh, is, is less than or greater than one and and for the points where it's less than one i know that no matter what points i start with if i if i put two inputs into the network after some number of layers they'll converge to the same point whereas if i'm in the chaotic phase and chi one is greater than one 
then no matter how close together my two inputs start, they'll diverge as they go through the network. And what's interesting about this is this is, for example, this in the middle here is the is an example for for Tanch units, and what we see is that like. Um, you know, several famous, we'll see later also that several famous uh, initialization schemes um, correspond to being at points that are sort of at the boundary between order and chaos. So the Xavier initialization, which is quite prevalent, uh, corresponds to one point on this line. Um, and one of the interesting things is that as you get very close to this, uh, to the transition between this order and chaos, um, these two, these two regions, um, you know, chi one being less than one or greater than one determines the stability of the fixed point. And as you get closer to the phase transition or the transition between order and chaos, you end up with a situation where chi one is becoming very close to one. And so the number of layers over which the cosine similarity approaches the fixed point, grows and diverges. So if I'm sufficiently close to the order to chaos critical point, then I can train neural networks of sort of arbitrary depth. And it turns out that if you're exactly on the, the critical point, the critical line, as often happens, um, the convergence goes from being exponential to power law. And you won't even show this. So this plot on the right is showing the number of layers over which um, you know, the network approaches its fixed point, and you can see that as you get very close to the critical critical line, this number gets very large. Um, okay, so this, this kind of went through what I consider to be like the forward propagation of signal. Um, and so if there are any questions, I'm happy to answer, and otherwise I'll keep going. Okay, so um, there's actually a, a, an interesting duality between the forward propagation of signal and the back propagation of gradients. Um, and so if I have some loss function L, I can just write down the back prop equations. And the back prop equations say that if I have some, you know, it gives you this thing called the, that, that's called the error signal delta which is like the derivative of the loss with respect to the preactivations at a given layer. And backpropagation tells you that the error signal at layer L can be written as a weighted sum of the error signal at the in the layer after you. So you kind of pull back the error signal through the network. Um, and if we just compute the square uh, of delta, we can work out that the um, the gradient scale, like the variance of the gradients at layer L, is is given by some factor that depends on the ratio of the widths. And we're going to ignore that and set that to one for now. So we're going to assume that our network has all equal widths, um, and it's multiplied by chi one, which is the stability of the term that corresponded to the c star equals one fixed point. And then it's multiplied by uh, the variance at the layer after you. So, so this says that like not only was the error, not only was the forward propagation of signal converging to its fixed point um, exponentially, but the back propagation of gradients change exponentially as well. And in particular, if chi one is greater than one, so if um, so, so, so yeah, so, so then, then we can like reason about the magnitude of gradients in terms of this sort of phase diagram, because this term that showed up in the forward pass, namely the stability of the C star equals one fixed point also shows up in the backward pass. So uh, the, the norm of a gradient for a network of depth L uh, will be given by chi one to the L. And so if your network has chi one less than one. So if you're in the ordered phase, this means that your gradients vanish exponentially quickly. Um, and if you're in the chaotic phase, so if chi one is greater than one, gradients explode, explode exponentially instead. And, and you can again work out like a depth scale 
uh, so like how many layer layers over which um, the, this convergence or, or I mean this this vanishing or explosion happens. Okay, so 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 we've we've kind of gone through um, sort of the two pillars of the mean field or the expected value theory for this, which is the forward propagation of signal and the back propagation of gradients. Um, and so we could make some claims about trainability. So if, if the depth is much greater than whatever the scale is for, for the fixed point, then you can say that the prior over functions is independent of the inputs. And if the prior over functions is independent of the inputs, signal can't pass through the, ne through the network in the forward direction, gradients are poorly behaved in the backward direction, networks shouldn't be trainable, and the result is data independent. So it doesn't matter, this is like a, you know, this might be kind of a loose result, but it doesn't depend on what the data is. It only depends on the network architecture. And one of the consequences of this, or one of the corollaries of this, is that at the transition between order and chaos, um, neural networks should be trainable at very large depths. So this is a prediction of the theory. And so now what I'd like to do is I'd like to go through a number of different applications where we've applied this kind of analysis and consistently found that sort of this picture does seem to bear out. So first, this is showing um, fully connected networks on uh, MNIST training for a short amount of time, CIFAR 10, uh, MNIST training for a long amount of time, and MNIST uh, with Atom. And in white dashed lines are the depth that our theory predicts the neural network that should bound the training dynamics of the neural network. And what we see is that consistently, the area of hyperparameter space, namely the area in the depth weight variance plane where the network is trainable, correspond to basically precisely where um, the network is shallower than this like critical depth. Um, and, and, and one of the things that LeChow is gonna talk about next, in a couple weeks is he's gonna show that actually, you know, this picture is maybe a little misleading, um, but I don't, I don't wanna get into why, uh, I'll let him do it. So, so this, this picture is not complete um, and his talk will go into corrections that we've realized exist since studying the NTK. Um, so, so you can actually also add dropout to this picture. So I'm not gonna go now, you know, in the interest of time and just like going through some examples, I'm not gonna go through the, the details, but you can add dropouts. You can ask what happens if I have even a little bit of dropout. And one of the things that happens is you see from the math that it destroys the, the order to chaos transition. And you can even think about why this is true. So if I have two inputs to the network and I start them and they're exactly at the same point, but they have different dropout masks. Then after one step of gradient descent or one step of applying the network um, primitive, um, those two inputs will no longer be the same. And so what this means is that the C star equals one critical or um, fixed point is no, C star equals one is no longer a fixed point. And so this significantly limits how deep you can train a network. So here are, the, this kind of like, so oh, I should just say, I guess I didn't say it in the previous example, but in these plots, red is overfitting to the data set. So these are like 100% training accuracy and black is zero, is like random, random chance. And so what we see here is that these three plots, A, B, and C are increasing the amount of dropout. And what we see is that, you know, adding dropout necessarily limits how deep you can train your network because you can't get signal all that deep. Um, and moreover, the theory continues, to, like very well describes the region uh, where you're able to uh, kind of get signal through. So uh, you can also look at like ReLU networks. And again, I don't want to dwell too much on the, on the math here. The only thing I'd like to say is that like the phase, there's still a phase diagram, but it ends up being quite different. So in the in this phase diagram, there's sort of like a bounded phase with exponential convergence where it, the, the variance approaches a fixed point. And then there's an unbounded phase where the angle 
decays very slowly like a power law and the variance explodes um, in, and, and becomes unbounded. And so when you look at sort of the phase diagram for ReLUs, you see that there's like this sort of bounded phase on the left and then an unbounded phase on the right. And then if you look right in the middle, uh, that's where the her initialization is. Um, so this gives kind of a nice picture that um, unifies, again, this like commonly used initialization scheme. Um, and if you look at the weight, if you look at the training, um, trainability plot, so this is just looking at, again, training accuracy, you see that the depth over which correlations vanish limits trainability uh, in the bounded phase, and the exploding norm of the activations limits trainability in the unbounded phase. You can do something similar with residual connections. So um, you can, you can, you know, do this calculation where you have uh, resnets um, and there are more hyperparameters. But the only point I'd like to make here is that again, sort of like the theoretical predictions here, we're showing curves of constant gradient magnitude as computed in this sort of like mean field or uh, an NGP or NTK setting. Um, so this is like show, um, and we're, we're seeing that like, there's a, a an optimal gradient magnitude um, that seems to, and, and it, that is related to the learning rate, but you can predict from theory. So the dashed line is a theoretical prediction. And then again, these red training accuracy curves are from training lots of models on various data sets. Um, and it works for ReLU or TANCH nonlinearities. Um, once again, you can you can also do do residual networks. So we we tried this on a couple different kinds of residual networks. Um, here, the setup is a little bit different. And um, instead, of, what you what we do is we feed in a signal over some t time steps. Instead of having l layers, we have t time steps, and we're able to sort of again predict as a function of the hyperparameters how many time steps over which our network should be able to train. And so, for example, one of the things that we observed is that there are large regions for gated recurrent networks that are able to train that are not, whereas like the, the, un, the, the ungated vanilla recurrent networks have a much tighter set of trainable hyperparameters. Um, one thing that I should say is that this theory that I've talked about um, doesn't really have any um, notion of weight tying in it. And so you can think of this as sort of the top line is what happens if we apply our theory to neural networks that exactly match the premises in the sense that we untie the weights. And then the bottom row of figures is what happens if we apply our theory to neural networks that do have weight tying. And we see that, especially for the gated networks, it does change the predictions quite a bit, uh, like uh, the, uh, the predictions a bit, but nonetheless, they give the right like kind of qualitative behavior for where neural networks should be trainable and where they shouldn't. Um, um, just a yeah. quick, uh, quick recap. So residual connections also reduce trainability, right? right? So here, yeah. So what can happen with residual connections if you don't initialize them well um, is that they lead to an explosion in the norm and so this is one of the reasons why like residual connections plus batch norm took off. Um, and then, you know, after, because, because, you know, batch norm allows you to um, kind of rescale, scale away this, this explosion of the norm. Um, and then if you look, it's kind of interesting. If you look at, there's a paper called fix up um, mm -hmm. by Jan Dauphin and one of their motivations when they, came up with fix up was trying to correct this behavior that we had identified. So, so they looked at the explosion that we were seeing and they realized that if you rescale the weights just right, you can eliminate it and then you don't need or have much less need for batch norm. So yeah, exactly. You're yeah, absolutely. So, um, two questions. First is like residual connections were added to like the convolutional architectures of the time. Mm -hmm. to allow them to train 
very deep nets. Mm -hmm. So how does that square with the theory? I yeah, good question. So I, I think part of the, okay, so first of all, let me just say that I think, you know, one of the things that we see, for example, here, or let me show you, so this is, this is for a convolutional network um, without residual connections. And one of the things that we observe is that while it's possible to train very deep convolutional networks, most choices of initialization won't work. And so if you don't have a theory to guide um, practice, it's much harder to come up with a non-residual connection architecture that will be trainable at large depths than it is to come up with a residual connection architecture. So I think I, I do think that one of the um, one of the reasons why people came up with residual connections was because we weren't very good at the time at initializing uh, neural networks. And um, since then, you know, there have been some papers that have shown that you can actually get con nets without residual connections to do pretty well. I still think residual connections help. Um, like, you know, you don't necessarily, they, they make you much less sensitive to initialization. Um, so I, I definitely think there's a point to having architectures that are less sensitive. Um, but it's also to un good to understand why the original architecture could or couldn't be trained, for example. Got it. And for transformers, we have both residual and dropout. And now we're training very deep transformers. So same idea or? I think so. So I, I think that residual connections, and, and I should say also like residual connections will also help with dropout. So, hmm. so this phenomenon of having like very limited trainable depth is really what happens when you combine sort of non-residual connection architecture with dropout. Um, I think that residual connections with dropout have no no such issue. Um, I think similarly, you know, transformers. We haven't done this kind of analysis uh, for transformers. I know that Roman does has worked out the covariance matrix, like the recurrence relation for the covariance matrix. So I don't think it would be terribly hard given his results. Um, but I. I I personally haven't done it. I think you know one of the things is the, the, the that I have heard is that like um, transformer architectures are a little harder to train. We're getting better at it, and probably adding residual connections helps. I know they still use layer norm, and I know that they often include warm up, which seems like it can help a lot with some initialization issues. Um, so yeah, so I, I think uh, yeah, I, I mean I, I think it's one of those things where like there's a, an open question of whether or not you need to under, how much you under, need to understand about initialization to train networks in practice. But nonetheless, I think it's the kind of, some, it, it's still worth kind of like, you know, thinking about at the back of your mind, okay, what are some issues that can be happening? Um, and these do seem like very robust indicators of when a network can be trained. And I imagine that if you have transformers that are very deep with residual connections, if you tried to do an analysis like this, um, you would find that they do, in fact, at initialization, propagate signal fairly well. Got it. Yeah, thanks. No problem. Yeah, so, um, OK, great. Uh, if, if there are any other questions, I'm happy to answer them. Um, yeah, so so we, we also looked at, as I was just kind of saying, we, we also looked at uh, convolutional networks. Um, and I think one of the interesting things about con nets is that they, they, you can actually show that they lose information at large depths. And, um, even if you, even if you initialize them perfectly, so even if you were like, okay, we're going to be at this point where, so here uh, on the left-hand side, we see the, the training accuracy, like, can it be trained? And on the right, we see the test accuracy for different depths. And you can see, we're really going to very, these are like, no residual connections. These are just pure com nets. Um, and what you can see is that we are able to overfit to the training data for very, very, very deep com nets. So 8,000 layer com nets were able to overfit to the training data. Um, but what you can also see is that the accuracy of the com nets sort of decreases towards the fully connected accuracy. And one of the reasons is, and, and it's related to what I'm going to talk about in a moment, but um, 
you know, the, these, these networks are losing other kinds of signals. So there's not just in, in com nets, right? You, you don't just have the, um, the index of the data point, but you also have the spatial structure of the image to worry about that you don't have, it turns out in the fully connected setting. Um, and so what's happening is it loses information about the spatial components at large depths. And there's actually a way of, um, that I won't get into, I, I mean, it's actually very simple. So, you know, you have, you normally have a kernel for your comnet, which is like, let's say a three by three kernel. If you initialize so that only the middle pixel of the kernel has variance and the rest of the uh, nine pixels, so the other eight pixels are zeros, then you get something that actually preserves signal at all frequencies. And you can train extremely deep comnets with no loss in accuracy. You don't gain very much, it turns out, but you, you don't lose it either. So this was like a very vanilla C CNN on CIFAR 10. And we were able to train up to 10,000 layers without any degradation um, in accuracy. Finally, we could do batch normalization. So, uh, and, and you know, one of the things that's interesting is when you dig into any of these cases, you end up with surprises that you sort of didn't know you would get run into. So, so for batch norm, the surprise was that um, if you don't have residual connections, you know, people think that batch norm improves um, the behavior of, of, of a network. But it turns out if you don't have um, residual connections, uh, actually batch norm causes gradients to explode for all reasonable activation functions. And it turns out there are some ways of, of improving this by like changing the epsilon or the beta or the gamma in, in batch norm, any of the hyperparameters, but it doesn't, it doesn't completely remove the effect. So, so this is just one interesting thing where like we use batch norm all the time and we think that it improves conditioning, but actually if you, if you use um, batch norm without residual connections, it can lead to worse conditioning, which was an interesting thing for us to learn. Um, okay, so, so I've talked a, little, a lot actually about sort of what I would call like average case behavior. So we've looked, you know, at the average cosine angle and we've looked at the average norm of the gradients. Um, but it turns out that fluctuations are also important. And this is where I'm gonna get into the isometric um, angle. So what we did to look at this is we studied what's referred to as the end to end Jacobian for the network. So this is if I have a network and it has some pre-activation Z naught in the first layer and some pre-activation ZL in the last layer, we're looking at the derivative of the last layer with respect to the first layer. So if, if I have an N by N, like let's say the, the network has with N, this will be like an N by N matrix. And if I write, and for a fully connected network, if I write out the equation for the Jacobian, it, it's a product of two things. It's, it's a product of diagonal matrices D, where the diagonal matrices on the on diagonal are like the derivative of the activation function acting on the pre-activation. And then it's multiplying those by the weights. So it's these, it's it's like DW, 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 where the Ws are random and the and the Ds are these um, diagonal matrices formed from the pre-activations. Um, and a few a few relationships make this maybe an interesting quantity to look at if we wanted to motivate it. So if we if we wanted to compute the gradient um, using backpropagation, the gradient at the input or the error signal at the input is given by the Jacobian, N10 Jacobian time the, times the error signal at the last layer. Um, you could also ask about linear response. So if I take an input and I move it slightly, the output is given, the change in the output is given by the transpose of the Jacobian. And finally, if I wanna ask about the manifold of state of, uh, um, the like in a geometric sense that the neural network forms, this is given by um, the metric of that manifold is given by J J trans J transpose J, and so we could ask you know what's a good prior for J? What what if we if we could choose anything? What would we choose? And so we we thought a very reasonable choice was isometry, um, which means that all the eigenvalues of J or all the singular values of J are one. So that means that it doesn't grow or shrink directions or ve uh, vectors in any direction. Whereas if you have a spread of the singular values, then some directions vectors will get longer and other directions vectors will get shorter as they get back propagated or forward propagated. Um, 
and so anyway, yeah. So 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 also like one other thing is that you know, like I said, we've just been looking at the um, the mean field, the mean field or the average case, which showed that the expected trace of the Jacobian um, was this chi one to the L. So it turns out, and I'm just going to you know give a very schematic argument here because I guess I'm a little short on time. Um, but you can use sort of a combination of random matrix theory and free probability to uh, work out the spectrum of the Jacobian. Um, and so what we'd like to do is we'd like to work out this thing called the density. So this is like the the, the density of the of, of eigenvalues. We're always going to look at J transpose J. So this is a square matrix. So we can compute its eigenvalues, which will be related to the square of the singular values. Um, and so we would like to concern ourselves with the density uh, row of eigenvalues. And so one of the fundamental tools is this thing called the Stilches transform, which takes you from the density to this other object, G, which is related to the moment generating function. So if you, if you know the density, you can do like a contour integral to come up with G. And if you know G, you, you can take a limit um, and compute the density. And it's related to the moment generating function. So if you know G, you can uh, work out all the moments of, um, of the eigenvalues. Um, and so there's another tool called the S transform. Um, and the S transform is related to the to, to, to the moment generating function. So you can work it out if you know G. And one of the very nice properties of the S transform is that if you have two matrices so um, that are multiplied together, then the S transform of the product is the product of the S transforms. So this gives you a way, if you have products of random matrices, of computing properties of the product in terms of pro products of the properties. Um, and so we can write down the S transform of J transpose J or JJ transpose. And you can see that it's like the diagonal, the S transform of the diagonal matrices to the power of L times the S transform of the weight matrices to the power of L. So if you, this depends, so what this is saying is that the spectrum of the Jacobian depends on two things. It depends on a term that looks at only the statistics of the pre-activations and it looks at a term that depends on only the statistics of the weights. Um, and so anyway, you can you can compute, you can go back from this and you can compute the moment generating function and, and the, the density. Um, and you can get a very simple expression also for the variance of the spectrum in terms of three things. It gives you a term that looks like the mean field or the the average case quantity, chi one, a term that depends on the statistics of the diagonal matrices, and then a term that depends only on the statistics of the weights, where Gaussian gives you S1 equals one and orthogonal gives you S1 equals negative one. And one of, and I don't, you know, not to dwell, but like one of the upshots of this is that you can only get isometry for orthogonal weights. Gaussian weights always will smudge out the variance a bit. Um, basically because you always get this one term that doesn't cancel if you use Gaussian weights. So you always get some variance if you use Gaussian weights, not necessarily if you get orthogonal weights. Um, and so one of the things that we did is we ran a large set of experiments with a ton of different optimizers. Um, blue was a well-conditioned, uh, or blue was orthogonal weighted, um, Tanch, red was uh, Gaussian weighted Tanch, and black was ReLU. And we were able to show that by using orthogonal weights, we were able to get significantly faster training convergence um, in this case. Um, and also, we could look at the effect of conditioning on generalization. So these are fully connected networks on CIFAR 10, so the accuracy is all bad. And I don't know if I would necessarily take these results um, too far, but we were able to show that like, as you change the variance of the fixed point Q star, you change the conditioning monotonically and, or, or, um, and you change the, and the final accuracy varies as well. Um, so yeah, so, so in conclusion, you know, we can say a lot about neural networks, I think, by understanding more about their priors. We can predict whether they're trainable and we can choose fast initialization schemes.
Um, and I think this disentangles trainability from model performance in a nice way. Um, but if you want to know more about the connection between this and actual generalization, I think uh, Le Chao will will talk about that a lot. So thanks. Okay, so thank you very much. Um, one other quick question is, you compared TAN H and Berlu, and I think another two activations. Has that work be extended for the like zoo of activations that we have nowadays with Mish, Swish, Jelu? Yeah, so you can so um, you can actually do any nonlinearity in this framework. Um, you usually have to start over with the analysis of the um, the phase diagram and like where what the fixed points are. But you can do any activation function just fits into the framework. The one thing I'll say is that like um, maybe I'll, I'll actually just share something. So so um, so for example, uh, is this sharing my screen again? Oh, uh, now it is. Now it is. Okay, great. Um, so the one thing that you have to do is, and it's similar to computing the NNGP NNGP kernel. So. Um, so you know you have to compute this expectation, these expectation values um, of basically phi phi transpose. Um, and for many, for some activation functions, you can compute this in closed form. But for some activation functions, you can't. So for the ones that you can't compute in closed form, you have to use numerical integration, and it's a little bit slower. But you can do the analysis for any choice of activation function. Nice, cool. Yeah, I don't see any other questions here. So thank you very much for the talk. Thank you. And see everyone next week or next talk. Bye. Bye. Thanks.